turn to you in a very unexpected way is just don't do it. It's easy enough just to declare them all in one way every time. Um, the second rule is only call hooks from React functions, and that way the runtime can properly sort of hook into them and figure out what's going on. Um, so in React function components and custom hooks, how do you know that something is a custom hook? You should always prefix your custom hooks with the use prefix. Um, and then you can use this fancy ESLint plugin that the React devs made. And what this will do is it will say, hey, you're using hooks in the wrong place. Or hey, you're using hooks in a conditional. <laughs> so I think it's pretty obvious why hooks. Traditionally in class components, it's hard to reuse stateful logic. Um, so you have to think about this. You have to think about all the other side effects that may need to be called. Um, Complex components become hard to understand really fast. So the difference between our 30 line hooks component and our 60 line class component, like it's just kind of slog to read through it and you fall asleep. Um, like the bigger a component gets, the more difficult it is to understand. Um, and classes confuse both people and machines. Like even the most seasoned JavaScript developer still has trouble understanding like what this is and why they have to bind functions. Um, and classes, especially in React, are not really the most natural way to go because you're inheriting from the React.component class, but like, you never inherit from a, com from a component that you create, right? Like, I mean, I never do. Um, so it just seems like a weird kind of mismatch of the way that things are actually working and sort of against the paradigms that the React developers have presented for us. Um, and I also think classes can confuse machines. So minifiers and transpilers have a lot of trouble with classes still, uh, partially because they're so new, and so that's been time to optimize for these things. But yeah, so like right now, your bundle size could be slightly smaller if everything was functions instead of classes. Uh, don't hold me to that, though, because if you add in the React Hooks API, your bundle will actually probably get a little bit bigger. Anyway, um, so what did we learn today? Hooks allow us to use state and lifecycle management without classes. Um, Hooks allow us to reuse lifecycle logic. What am I, am I just reading all this? Um, hooks cut my code in half. Hooks can be easier on your minifier. Um, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that hooks are completely opt-in and backwards compatible. So what I don't want you to do tonight is to go home and make a bunch of JIRA tickets to convert all your class components to functional components with hooks. Um, because I don't want your manager to hate you and I don't want your manager to hate me. Um, just, it's not necessary. What I do want you to do is the next time that you're using a functional component and you need to refactor it to have state, is to consider using hooks instead and see if you can do it more easily and with less work. Um, hooks just came out in React 16.8, which was released uh, February 6th, 5th, something like that. In fact, I had a disclaimer slide in here when I first started writing these that said, hey, this is an alpha. Anything I say could be wrong in a month. But now everything I say is true. So, Believe it all. Um, any questions before I run a little bit over? But are there any questions that are easy, not hard, like about testing deep nested things? Cool. Um, so feel free to talk to me during the intermission or after the event. And um, I would love to talk to you about React and how you're using React. And if you've used hooks in production, because that'd be a really cool thing to know. Um, Here's all the resources for this talk, and thank you very much for your time. And so now we're going to take a short five minute intermission while Eric gets set up, and feel free to eat more and uh, wipe out the drinks, and see you soon. Okay, so uh, like Larry said, my name is Eric Carter. I work at Granular. Uh, I'm an engineering manager there. So um, if you see some code, you're like, oh, that looks like stuff I used to do in like 2009. I'm a manager. Remember that. So, um, so yeah. So one of the things that uh, prompted me to, to look at this topic is uh, I've been building web apps for a long time. Um, performance is always something I try to pay attention to. But in a lot of legacy apps that I've worked on, that I've consulted on, um, they just seem to grow and get to a point where it seems to be really hard to... Oh, great. We're going to deal with this already. Okay.
Um, anyways, they keep they grow to a point where they, they they're slow, and they um, and it's not just a quick slam dunk uh, set of opportunities to make them faster. And so uh, when service workers kind of came on the the scene, I was very interested to see what that might bring to the table from a performance standpoint. So in the context of progressive web apps, what I'm going to be talking today mostly about is seeing how we can make our, our sites more performant. So if you were here, coming here to look at how we can do offline first design, that type of thing, you might get a little bit of that in here, but that's not quite where my focus is going to go. So, um, so yeah, real quick before I get started, is anyone actively running service workers in prod today? Yes. All right. No one to call your blood. No one to heckle me. <laughs> Legitimately, at least. So, um, so yeah. This is me on a daily basis. You can ask these guys. Uh, I tend to move faster than I probably should on some things. So, um, so let me show us show you a quick demo here. So this is my uh, my little demo site here. Um, you can see it's like a business app. This is kind of where my life has mostly been focused on. Um, got a nice uh, graph here. Let's see if I can zoom in here a little bit. Okay. And what I'm going to show you here is this thing is slow. All right. Um, I do have a service worker rigged up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to disable that for a second here. And just show you, here's what this site looks like when it loads. Ah, dang it. All right. So it's spinning up. You can see up there in the corner. Spinning. Page is kind of loads. We got assets now, but still, there we go. All right. We've seen apps like this. Like, our time to first paint, it's fantastic. Our time to interactive is miserable, right? So how can we make some improvements on that? Well, uh, as you can see, I've set up a uh, service worker here. I'm going to uh, turn it back on and just bam. So we got, went from, I think when I timed it, when I was sitting here, we're at probably a full seven seconds to, to interactive, and now we're at less than a second, okay? So, so how do we get here? How do we accomplish this? Well, I use Workbox. And so, uh, to dig in a little bit to what Workbox is, um, you need to understand what service workers are. Okay, what's the general feeling around understanding service workers? Who feels like they got it, like it's it's rock solid in their brains? What service workers are? How many of you have never heard of a service worker? Cool. Okay. So, um, how many of you have actually built desktop apps though outside of browsers, like? good old DB6 type things, yeah. So um, in good old desktop programming, you get threads to deal with things, right? And you can do stuff on background threads. So service workers is a one path that the browser is giving you to have a separate thread to do things with, okay? So uh, a couple concepts about service workers that are important to understand. So per, URL per uh, domain, you get one service worker for all the tabs that you might have open in your browser. So if you're at google.com and google.com is using a service worker, they'll have one service worker and you can have 800 tabs open, but they, you still get one service worker. And so it's, really, it's a really nice mechanism for being able to communicate between tabs. And for what I'm gonna show you later, be able to share data between tabs, okay? Uh, 
So then, if, if you've heard a little bit about service workers, you might have also heard a little bit about web workers, okay? Web workers can be confusing if you're, if you're not in this every day, but web workers, it kind of goes back to that same concept I was saying about threads. It's also another way you can have a threading model. Web workers are meant more for, uh, I need to do some computational intensive work. I don't want it to consume my, my singleton service worker. So I can actually just hand off, um, like I said, computationally intensive work to a web worker. I can run as many web workers as I want per tab. But you don't have access in a web worker to like a lot of the things that a service worker does. I'll show you that here in a second. So, and then lastly, why, why is Workbox all of a sudden something more special than anything? Well, I don't think it is, um, but y'all used jQuery before? Workbox is the jQuery for service workers, okay? Some people may shoot me for saying that, but in my kind of assessment at this point, um, service workers are new enough out there that there's still some rough edges and Workbox helps you get right to business and accomplish things fairly quickly. Okay. So one of the things I'll show you here in uh, my little code base here. Okay. Is um, have any of you built a React app or at least run the Create React app? recently, okay, you run Create React app, especially with version two, and you get Workbox out of the box. So it will spin up a service worker for you, and uh, sorry. and you can see it, let me pull this up here. So I did this right before here because I wasn't sure about the network. So this is what a uh, brand new Create React app skeleton looks like. You open up the source, you got <coughs> service worker, um, and in the compiled output you can see that's what Workbox looks like right from the template, okay? Wow, that's awful. <laughs> Sorry. See if I can blow that up a little bit more. Is that a little bit better? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I won't spend a ton of time here, but uh, I'll dissect this a little bit. Um, what Create React App is scaffolding out is effectively a uh, all the things you would need to do to cache your JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and images for your website into the browser. So this, if you have just a pure static content website, what this will do right out of the box is make it offline capable, okay? So if you have no interactive content or if it's interactive but just like, you know, it bounces when you hover over it or something like that, uh, this will save your bacon for offline mode. It will make your pages way faster because it just serves them straight from a local cache rather than a than a uh, server side cache and uh, could make you very happy. And it's, I mean, it took me five minutes worth of work to get that functioning on my little demo site. So, um, and so yeah, so like a, a little bit here, you can see the work box um, methods that it's calling pre cache and route, and it's passing in this pre cache manifest. Um, this is some of the plumbing that happens when you use Create React App. Webpack, if you use Webpack, it will compile, it'll compile your site out, it'll you know, generate all of the um, hash asset names, and it will build a pre-cache manifest for you so that when you deploy your site, 
you at least have some ver some uh, way of versioning the content of that site. So every time you redeploy, you'll have different hashed assets, and then the, the uh, local service worker will automatically just start to keep will keep that stuff uh, up to date in your local browser. So, um, so yeah. So let's uh, let's keep churning here. So this again, this is what it looks like fresh out of the box. I wanted to be a real glutton for punishment. And so I decided I would generate it with TypeScript, okay? Because who doesn't love a little more pain in their life? Um, and so let's take a little bit of a look into what that, uh, that, that looks like. So one of the first things I had to do, and I can dive into this later if others are interested in, but the first thing I think most of us experience if you use Create React App, is about an hour into working on it, you're like, wait, I need to change how Webpack's configured. And then you're like, oh, but Webpack is baked into CRA. I, I have to eject to do that. That, turn, that becomes a very nasty road. Um, so there's a nice little tool called React App Rewire that allows you just to override individual pieces of uh, your Webpack config and hook into if you want to tweak how your TypeScript's compiled or Um, the next big decision you have to make is whether you want to use Workbox's uh, Generate Service Worker or Inject Manifest. And if you're looking like, what does that even mean? Google has a fantastic site that gives you pros and cons of what these mean. And what do these mean? So the Generate Service Worker starting point is kind of what I described before. You take a static site, it's like, if all your stuff's just static, this will give you everything you need without anything extra. Um, if, you're, if you kind of want to go off the rails and do your own thing, then you want to inject manifest. Okay? So, wow, that is really tough to see. Okay. So then... Let's look a little bit here at what happens when I want to build my site here. So I got my site, uh, I got my main entry point for that. Um, get into this in a little bit, but here's the magic. Right out of the box with, with uh, Create React App, it has a little um, function there to register a service worker, and that is what will get your service worker set up. And so you can kind of see this is all the generated code out of the template. But the real magic is basically right in here. So it's going to say, my service worker file exists here at my, basically my main uh, 